Great. And then should we get started? Do some intros for Sean. Um, and then we've got reviewing the minutes, report back from the other committees, and then really wanting to dive in on VHIP, um, saving a little bit of time for the FY23 budget asks for stipends for city committees. And then um, I also just shared two other things that I got that we could discuss during other business. So how does that um, how does that agenda sound? I'd like to add to other business a brief report on the history page for the Montpelier history. Oh, page. great, great. Um, or we could do that as report backs from. Uh, it's like other city committees, but it's like and other oh. related. How does that sound? Just do a first okay. thing because that's it. I'm excited about it. Well. Is. <laughs> okay. All right. Cool. Um, well, we can start with uh, in introductions. Yeah, Sean. Hi, I'm Shana Casper. I use your pronouns. Um, I'm on Kent Street, and I don't feel like I've had any time for doing any learn self learning right now. <laughs> it's like very silly, but obviously I'm always learning, but always um, little little fried at the moment. Uh, but I'll pass it to Michael. Hi, I'm Michael Sherman. Um, we have communicated by, by, yeah. by email. Um, I'm a member of this committee and uh, also of the Montpelier uh, Community Fund Board. Uh, and I've been a resident of the city since 1985. Uh, Pellin, you want to go next? Yeah. Morning. Uh, I'm Pellin Kahn. Um, I'm also board member. I work for Norwich um, University. And uh, like Shaina, I didn't do too much because it was a grading week, all the midterms and everything. So um, maybe next time I can share with something about uh, like new learning uh, opportunities. And Jeremy? Morning, my name is Jeremy Beaudry, resident of Montpelier up on Elm Street uh, and a member of the committee. Uh, all right, and Cameron? I'll just keep calling on people, here we go. Hi, I'm Cameron Niedermeyer. I'm the staff support for this committee and the assistant city manager. And Lauren. Hey, good morning, everyone. Lauren Hurl. Um, I am the city council uh, liaison. So I'm the city council for District One. And um, one self learning thing I've been reading the book White Rage, which I don't know if anyone's read, but really um, just like fascinating and awful history of kind of like US history with the uh, like through like reconstruction and I'm like halfway through the book now, but it just like is, you know, a lot of history we didn't learn in school of like how people um, worked to uphold, um, you know, Jim Crow segregation, the white supremacy structure. So would recommend that book, even though I'm just halfway through it. Thanks. And Sean, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sean Gilpin. I am the director of the housing division at the Department of Housing and Community Development, uh, which is part of the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, and uh, happy to talk about, about VHIP. Uh, it's a, an, an exciting program we're hoping to have up and running uh, imminently. So um, yeah, and then um, I know you folks have some other stuff on your agenda. Uh, if it's all right um, and not too disrespectful, I might bow out um, after we cover the VHIP stuff to uh, of frankly tackle some of the uh, application <laughs> materials that we're putting together for the uh, uh, hurriedly before a press release comes out. So but happy to meet you all. Thank you. Thanks. Um, let's just review and approve the minutes real quick. If um, folks have those pulled up, let me know if I should share my screen. Um, if anyone had, thank you so much to Cameron for taking notes. Also, do we have a note taker for this meeting? Shoot, that's never. I'm, I'm yeah. ready and I'll take notes today too. Thank you so much, Cameron. Um, but does anyone have any um, edits? I'll move to approve the, the minutes uh, circulated. 
Michael made a motion. A second. Jeremy seconds. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Um, and so then for report facts, um, uh, Michael, do you want to share a little bit about the website? And then um, does anyone else have other city committee report backs as well we or fine. other related report backs? Okay, I can just tell you that um, uh, we have two authors, um, Je Je Jess Robinson, the state, ar the state uh, archaeologist, um, did the first, did the prehistory or the indigenous history of the area. And Paul Carnahan, the librarian at the Vermont Historical Society, did the, the rest. Um, um, I've gone through them. We've, uh, they're both in second revisions. Uh, we're working out a few things. I'm not sure if if the city folks want to vet them before we before you put them up. Okay, because there are a couple of places where Paul and I have had an exchange, and we're not quite sure what to do next. Okay. Um, um, and then after that, after we've gotten uh, the text put together, Paul and I will look for photographs and other images, and, and maybe Jess will be involved in that as well. We did set us, we did have a budget for this. So, um, Paul is receiving a stipend for his work. Jess uh, said that that's part of his job. He wouldn't take a stipend, so that was very kind of him. And we have we have a hundred dollars set aside for the use um, of for images if the historical society chooses to impose its usual fee. Um, so I think we're getting close to the end. And um, um, so amazing, Michael. I'm so excited to read it and, and to have that as a resource. Like, it just has to feel so, like, such a clear step and, like, thing to check the off. And, like, there's not often in this work you're like, awesome, we did the thing. And <laughs> this feels like we're, we're, get, we're, like, getting close to doing that check. Right. Anything else? That's my excitement. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's good too. And it's a big improvement over what we have. So. Cool. And then, yeah, anything else from, yeah, the school board meeting, the, um, it feels like a million years ago, and yet it was just two weeks ago of, um, from, you know, from, from our last meeting of, of um, you know, police review, uh, of budget, School board, yeah, all of, all of the different things that we're all engaged in. Quick update on police review, um, and Michael, please, and Cameron, um, add in. But the, our last um, meeting, the Montpelier Police Department came in and gave um, a series of updates on actions that they were taking that were kind of putting into action the uh, a set of the police review committee recommendations, and you know there was like a suite of them that the police department and police review committee all kind of agreed on. There's still a handful of items that were recommended that the police department is either like just not acting on yet because there's more work to be done or figuring out and some things that they didn't support. So those are still kind of in progress, but um, a lot of like training and um, resources around that, body cameras, some other things. There's um, just a lot of work going on and better uh, transparency around data. Um, so anyway, it was very encouraging to see a lot of work underway of moving forward, a lot of the recommendations. Um, and of course, like more work to be done to follow through on all of them and um, take up some of the ones that were, I think, more controversial and see what happens with those with council. I'll just say the the, the the review committee is no longer an active committee. That is, our our commission re expired, and so uh, the, few, the the folks who showed up are doing this as a kind of volunteer. Um, well, it was all volunteer, but um, kind of watchdog and reference. You know, so if the, if uh, we'll have it, we'll have other meetings in the future, um, just to sit, you know, to keep up with the, what the police the, and the city are doing and. Uh, I'm not sure what will happen is with whether the city will appoint an, uh, another committee, a permanent committee. It's undecided yet. I think. I don't know what the city council has been thinking of. 
Yeah, I don't think we we haven't even really talked about that yet. I think it's like let's focus on implementing the first set of recommendations and then figure out what the next phase looks like. Is my sense. Great. Um. All right. Can we hand it over to Sean to give an overview on BHIP and 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 yeah, what's going what's going on with you guys? Sure. Great. Thanks so much again. And um, yeah, so I'll, I'll jump right in. So uh, VHIP is, um, it's actually a, so it currently stands for Vermont Housing Improvement Program. Um, there's been some uh, changes over, over the I. <laughs> um, it's been, it's been uh, noted, it's been called investment, it's been called um, incentive, but we're going with improvement. So <laughs> Vermont Housing Improvement Program. And it's actually a, um, a type of program that our department has pitched for a number of years, and unfortunately, um, due to just other political ramifications, it hadn't gotten much traction, or at least um, the bills that it usually got associated with over the past couple of years didn't end up making it through the legislature. Um, however, we were lucky enough last year um, to be able to use some of the CARES Act funding, the coronavirus relief funds, um, to run a program um, that was actually called the Rehousing Recovery Program. So if you see RHRP and wonder why um, that acronym is being used, um, we used CARES Act funding um, to run a substantially similar program to what we're hoping to launch again. And the idea is to um, working through the five home ownership centers throughout the state. So it covers, they cover every region of the state. For you guys, it would be downstreet housing and community action, or excuse me, community development. Um, just usually referred to as downstreet. You guys are probably familiar with them. Um, so working with the five home ownership centers throughout the state um, to identify private property owners who have um, potential rental units that are um, offline or, or have other habitability issues, you know, code, you know, rental housing health code issues, um, and providing relatively um, small grants, and I say relatively small in sort of the context of uh, affordable housing development. So grants of up to $30,000 per unit. Um, with the VHIP, it's a 10% or excuse me, a 20% match is required. And the goal is to bring these units back online um, and rented at affordable rates for at least five years. And um, we were able to successfully bring online about 240, uh, excuse me, 249 units of housing this way in the, um, the CARES funded program. We uh, originally had asked for uh, general funds um, to continue the program and the governor's budget request last year uh, requested $5 million each year for three years um, to run the program. The legislature ended up actually giving us $5 million of American Rescue Plan Act funds, uh, which admittedly, you know, it's understandable that they wanted to use, you know, some of the federal um, funds that are coming into the state. Unfortunately for us, that complicates things a little bit because of the, the required um, uses of those funds. So um, the way that we're running the program, or at least are proposing to run the program um, in the coming year is, uh, so again, it would be grants of up to $30,000 per unit. The units need to be vacant because of code non-compliance. Um, there still needs to be that five-year affordability covenant, and that um, will restrict um, the rental rates to what's uh, sort of wonkily called the HUD fair market rent, which in colloquial terms, that's just the, the maximum amount of rent that um, uh, Section 8 or Housing Choice Voucher um, can pay. So the idea is to keep the units affordable for at least five years. And also the, um, the sort of big caveat with the ARPA is that um, the units actually must be rented to somebody who is exiting homelessness. And so the property owner is going to be required to, um, and that's a, also a five-year covenant. So the property owner is going to be required to work with what's called the Coordinated Entry Lead Organization. And so if folks aren't familiar, we have a, a network of homeless service providers that um, uh, the uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, refers to as the Continua of Care. Um, and Vermont actually over the last couple of years has implemented um, basically a, a, a data management system so that when people, um, you know, are sort of sort of touch the, the system, so to speak, so enter a shelter or um, receive assistance from a, from a homeless shelter provider, um, their information is collected 
um, in a secure uh, system, and that's called coordinated entry. And the idea there is that you know if if I were um, to need services from let's say a, a shelter in, in Barrie or or Montpelier, and then um, you know a couple of weeks later moved up to the Burlington area. Uh, I wouldn't have to redo an application and, and all the rest of it. They already have the info in there. So the idea is to kind of streamline sort of one, one point of entry to the whole system. So that's just a little background on why we're choosing to use the coordinated entry lead organizations because they're well equipped to sort of make referrals to landlords. Um, so that's, um, that's sort of in a nutshell. So I'll stop there. I know that was a lot and, and um, take some questions and then I'll happy to elaborate. I have a question um, to start. So with, with this latest round of funding that is focused on folks coming out of homelessness, are it sounds like the, I think coordinating care organization is what you use. That's kind of makes the connection between the individual that needs housing and various kind of private landlords who might be interested in, the pro, in this funding for rental units on, getting rental units online. Um, is, is that really the only kind of conduit for folks to, to get housing? Is that the process? Um, that's, that is how we envision it working this time around. Um, and, and that particular, um, that particular nexus um, between the ARPA funding and the homelessness, that might, um, that might evolve over time if we do end up getting either additional funding or different funding sources for the program. But yeah, the idea is that the um, coordinated entry lead agencies are kind of the best um, mm -hmm. suited to quickly make the referral and, and make ongoing referrals because we are going to require um, for that five-year period that at turnover, the, the property owner needs to go back to the coordinated entry mm -hmm agency to to bring in you know new so it's not a it's not a one you know for one and done um but yeah they are they're kind of the mo the more sophisticated um groups uh and one of the just for a little context too in the in the the previous program the 2020 program that we ran um we kind of did a hybrid where the affordability covenant was there the same um for five years but the um the property owner only had to um, consider three referrals from the continuum of care organizations, um, which is a bit of a broader definition of organizations than the than coordinated entry. Uh, and it, it ended up being quite, quite chaotic. And oftentimes the landlords, the property owners didn't really know who they were supposed to be talking to, or they were getting calls from a lot of different organizations. So we're trying to streamline and make it a little more concise about exactly who they should be um, going to just to make it a little, a little simpler and, and more successful in, in trying to, to serve people who are most in need. Does that answer the question? <laughs> sure, Michael. Hey. Um, in the uh, in the first memo that we, that I saw, which I guess is the 2020, there was a, there were two parts. There was the rental housing investment, which was two million set, proposal was two million. Then there was a home ownership, a purchase and rehabilitation of a million dollars set aside, and 25 percent of that was a minority ownership. Now, what's happened? To, you didn't mention either of those in your report. Are they still part of the program? So they are kind of separate. Um, you know, we we pitch them to the legislature as as two sort of two sides to the same coin. Uh, I'll readily admit that until uh, until about six six months ago, um, our department consisted of me and one other individual who dealt with uh, mobile home parks. Um, so we have only just been able to expand our staff a little bit, and we're also overseeing the. Um, the rental assistance program and mortgage assistance. So admittedly, we have not gotten this home ownership rehab program up and running, although we have the appropriation for it. And we'll once we get VHIP going again, um, we'll probably pivot to, to opening that back up. But the idea there 
um, is, is, is similar, but on the home ownership side, basically to provide um, essentially construction loans for first time Vermont home buyers who, you know, might be able to afford a place that needs immediate work. And right now it's really difficult to get financing for that. You know, we've been hearing anecdotally, especially from realtors that, you know, people might get qualified for a mortgage, but then as soon as the uh, inspection comes through, the bank is no longer interested in, in, um, uh, financing a particular home because of the repairs that are needed. So our idea there is to um, is to start and operate a program that would be ongoing um, to kind of do a similar similar thing with with addressing habitability and rental units through VHIP, but um, have it be for uh, first time home buyers uh, who who might um, be interested in in purchasing and fixing up homes. Um, I will say we actually have been doing some research and have found um, there's there's actually a HUD program that might be a really great match with this. And we've been in discussions with the Vermont Housing Finance Agency as well, which has a down payment assistance program. So we've been tinkering a little bit with how the how this the home ownership side will work, um, but we're still a ways away before we can um, for ready to launch launch that. And is the minority ownership set aside still part of the plan? It's still part of the plan, although um, the I, I hesitate, and, and this might seem like parsing words, I hesitate to call it a set aside because there's some fair housing implications um, for, um, so I think, I think it would be more accurate to call it a goal, and, we, um, and we're going to achieve that goal by sort of specifically reaching out um, as best we can to BIPOC and other minority communities in order to in order to make sure that they have you know enough access to these particular funds um, in order to in order to reach that. Um, but I would I would be hesitant to call it a, a, a true set aside. Um, well, I was just quoting from the from the memo. Yeah, um, yeah no, I, I I appreciate that, and and uh, I I regret the uh, the wording of of how we put that together, but um, just want to be want to be clear. And did the legislature have to approve that change from a goal, from a set aside to a goal, or is that? I believe in the, um, well, we're actually in an interesting situation where both VHIP and this home ownership program were described in S79, which had a, a larger rental housing safety and registry components. Um, in the quirks that are our legislature, the policy bill ended up getting vetoed by the governor because of concerns about the rental registry, um, which is, in my humble opinion, rather unfortunate. Um, however, the appropriation did actually make it into the budget. Um, so one of the reasons why it's taken us so long to get VHIP up and running is we're in kind of a, an interesting legal situation where the policy describing the program um, wasn't passed into statute, but the appropriation was allowed. So we had to figure out um, whether or not we were legally even allowed to run the program. And after a lot of consultation with um, with various lawyers, um, it was determined that we do, our department has the statutory authority to create programs to address housing. And since we had the appropriation, we were able to move forward, but it delayed things. So that's a long way of saying um, the legislature uh, did not actually, and and for what it's worth, in S seventy nine, I believe um, the change was made to call it um, to call it a goal rather than a set aside for those reasons. And I'm hopeful. Um, my understanding, and I, I don't want to speculate too much, um, but my understanding is there's been some conversations between the chair of the um, the chairpersons of the two housing committees in the you know in the House and the Senate, and the governor's office. And I think they've come to a a reasonable um, uh, a reasonable uh, uh, agreement compromise is the word that's escaping me. A reasonable compromise um, on what will have to be a new S79. They'll do a strike all because the dates that were included in that um, have passed, and so they can't they can't simply do a veto. Uh, it would be impractical to simply do a, try to do a veto override. So there's going to be some changes, and I'm I'm pretty confident that early in the session we'll see. Um, we'll see the actual statutory language pass, and that'll also help us kind of move forward with the homeowner um, aspect. Uh, so, yeah, that's all. That's that's as much uh, reading of tea leaves and looking into the crystal ball as I'll go for uh, the next legislative session. I've been around just long enough to know that never expects the expected. <laughs> 
and it's and it's probably uh, anomaly that the, the the money is there, but the policy isn't. Usually, in my you know watching Congress, they'll pass a bill and say, "Oh yeah, we'll do this and that," and then they don't fund it. Yeah, that is that is uh, my experience as well. Um, so this this is quite uh, quite a uh, cart before the horse situation here. Um, well, congratulations! That's been, yeah, <laughs> thanks. At least have the funds. That's good. Yeah, I will say um, if if there's anything uh, beneficial out of this pandemic, it's been an incredible amount of resources going into housing and and homeless service. Um, it's been it's been amazing to go from a, a lack of resources to suddenly uh, more than we we can implement. Um, so we've got a rapidly increasing unhoused population here and no place to put folks. So mm -hmm. what is the realistic timeline of some of these opening up for folks, even sure. if they're in the continuum of care? Is there going to also side note, is there going to be preference for people who are already in our community? Or will people be like trucking into communities that have these programs? Um, the first off, the timeline I expect that will be. Um, so uh, let me back up. So the home ownership centers uh, downstreet included have already begun sort of informal waiting lists of interested property owners. So they've got people in the queue who are interested, understand the parameters, and are ready to begin construction as soon as um, they get the green light. I'm hopeful that um, the program will sort of officially be launched and will start um, start projects prior to Christmas. Um, we're we're being pretty aggressive about trying to get this this going. So this month, I think, um, is reasonable that that properties will start um, start work. We have a requirements um, in the agreement letters between the homeownership centers and the property owners that. Um, the properties need to be completed and uh, and occupied within 18 months of signing the agreement letter. We worked a lot faster than that last year um, just because of the nature of the CARES Act funding. So I think um, we'll probably start to see um, units opening up in the spring or possibly even before. It sort of depends a bit on um, it depends a bit on, you know, the the amount of work that needs to be done to a particular unit. You know, some some might might be relatively small fixes that can happen quickly. Some might be, you know, much more serious renovations or even, you know, converting um, uh, buildings that you know have poor layout or too many bedrooms for the market to, you know, multiple apartments is is another option for these funds. Um, so it's. I, it won't be a silver bullet to to you know completely eradicate homelessness in the particular area, but um, we're hopeful that it will it will be a good um, dovetail into other um, other efforts going on. And the um, the vision is to as far as sort of the locale of individuals, um, the coordinated entry lead organizations do each have particular regions that they work with. So the idea is to try to keep people as close to where. Um, as close to the community that they're a part of as possible. So um, we're certainly not encouraging, you know, significant movements of, of populations from, from one region to another. Who's our coordinated entry organization in, in this area? You know, that is a great question. And I wish I'd looked it up before meeting with you guys. Um, they're admittedly a bit, um, it's, a bit outside of my uh, it's my wheelhouse. Um, you know, we we kind of um, we typically deal more with the the bricks and sticks, if you will, and it's it's agency of human services that that um, okay. oversees the COCs. I do have a list though um, that uh, I can look up and send send to you for, I'll follow up um, on the uh, invitation email with that that information. Would it be capstone? Is um, I'm not it. It very well could be. That seems the most likely. Um, but sometimes it's um, sometimes there's there's other organizations that actually do the the data input. Um, but Capstone is definitely part of the continuum of care, and they'll they'll be involved, I imagine, in, in the referrals. Um, do you know if do they have a landlord liaison program at Capstone? Well, I think they used to. Um, I was on the board for several years, um, and I'm pretty sure there was that there was such a program. Yeah, yeah that, I don't know. I don't know if that's still the case. They got sort of out of the the landlording stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they unloaded their own properties, and I don't know. 
um, what what their relationship is with other landlords. I... Uh, the other kind of technical question I had is, and maybe we don't need to know this in our committee, but <clears throat> where's the kind of flow of information in terms of Montpelier, the city understanding this, the breadth of this program and how many units we might be expect to come online in the next 18 months? Is that, does Downstreet own that information? Are they interfacing with other city groups? Um, yeah. um, I guess so just in general too, like what does $3 million mean for the state too? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so we anticipate, um, so with, so there's a $5 million allocation and um, it's going to be distributed, like I said, between the, the five home ownership centers. Um, I don't have the budgets that they provided right in front of me, um, but it's, it, it's not going to be a million a piece. There's kind of differing, um, differing interests. Actually, um, interestingly enough, uh, the lowest amount of property owner interest is in Chittenden County. Um, and I think the highest is is up in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, uh, I don't recall the numbers that Downstreet um, is considering. We anticipate that um, with that five million, we'll probably translate into about 140 to 145 units throughout the state. Um, so it's not an enormous amount, but it's definitely um, you know it's it's not insignificant. There has been a lot of uh, legislator and gubernatorial interest in this program. Uh, I don't, again, don't want to um, speculate too much, but I think it's safe to say that there's going to be uh, an ask from the governor's office in the Budget Adjustment Act to increase the amount of funding um, for this program in particular. Uh, and one of the reasons why we're kind of launching, we're uh, getting wait lists and there'll be hopefully next week a press release on this directing people to contact their home ownership centers um, if, if there's interest uh, is to kind of develop some support for the program and really um, be able to articulate why this should um, be funded at a higher rate than the than the five million for what it's worth um, right now especially with increased um, increased uh, material and labor costs we're seeing a traditional sort of multifamily subsidized housing development um, costing about $300,000 per unit. Um, so the idea of, of bringing units online for $30,000 per unit, you know, one tenth of that public investment um, is naturally getting a lot of attention um, with appropriators. So my fingers are crossed that we'll see this program um, grow in, in the amount of money that's available for it. Uh, and hopefully the, the interest will stay there. So all that's sort of, a, again, a, a long answer. Sorry, I keep being so verbose in these. Um, but uh, there, there will likely be more interaction between more information sharing between the home ownership centers and, and localities this time around than um, in the, the what seemed like a one off with the CARES funding. Um, it's also important, well, good to note that um, our department for the first time ever has actually been able to hire a communications director. So we now actually have somebody who can specifically get some of this information out. Um, you know, in the in the before times, it was just me writing press releases and updating our website, um, along with actually administering all the programs. So I'm hopeful that we'll be able to be a conduit for more information for interested municipalities. Um, but also Do you have to so, opt in or anything, or is it, I mean, this is just happening. I don't have to like, it's just to get the word out. Right. Uh, yeah, there's no, there's no opt in or opt out. It's working with, you know, private, private property owners to, to improve properties. Um, I, you know, uh, I would, I would hope that there wouldn't be any, any municipalities that want to opt out of improving the housing stock in their area, but, um, I'm sure, I'm sure there's, uh, uh, I'm sure there's there's some healthy concern about about exactly what that what that would mean. Um, one of the one of the reasons I think why this program has gotten quite a bit of traction talk is that it's it's not concentrating um, poverty. It, it is you know trying to trying to spread people out so that you don't you know it's perhaps a little bit more palatable to have a, an apartment here or there as opposed to say you know purchasing a hotel and running it as a as a transitional housing um, that, that kind of can get people a little, um, a little concerned uh, about the effects of that. Um, but no, there's, there's not a particular, I mean, 
not a particular opt out. I'm sure. Um, I'm sure the home ownership centers would be eager to to partner with with, or I'm sure Downstreet would be eager to partner with you guys to, um, you know, to broadcast the availability of the program, and we would certainly encourage that. That was going to be my next question. What what can a committee like this do to be of some help to you, if anything? Um, you know, I. Off the top of my head, I, I don't know that I have a particular plan um, for a group like this other than, um, yeah, I, I, I am happy to, you know, keep you folks on my list of, of groups to contact when um, things change or more things become available uh, to, to, you know, reach out to, to whatever your own networks or, you know, distributions, listservs, the things like that. Um, I think... I think we'll learn more sort of as it, as things evolve and roll out and we see what the, what the actual interest is. Um, but yeah, I, I will, I'll be happy to stay in touch as, as things, um, as things evolve. Has, has there been any thinking about like, I mean, I guess Michael's question kind of got at it, but like, are there any, barriers that you see from local city like ordinances or anything that make this more difficult any like challenges that a city could get ahead of like ours or or are there opportunities on the flip side of like you know like matching some of our own ARPA funds to for the, that the city got to like expand or like put the program into greater effect more quickly and you know get more housing units online or like any anything like that that from a city government level you're seeing would be a help or a particular hindrance to making this as effective as possible? Sure. No, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I'll i definitely reach out to um, the homeownership centers and, and ask about barriers last time. I mean, to be honest, uh, off, um, off the top of my head, um, you know, I don't think that the 2020 program really had too many municipal um, barriers, partly because we're dealing with existing, largely dealing with existing structures. Um, so there, there, the, the level of permitting is, is, has been relatively minimal. Um, although, you know, that's always, uh, we did allow for new unit creation, um, but not in, uh, I don't think we did any any actual new buildings, you know, it would be like converting a carriage house or something like that, or, or you know, creating a basement apartment or um, what have you. Um, so I, I don't know that there's a huge municipal barrier. I think the biggest barriers, to be honest, are going to be um, labor availability and and um, material availability. Uh, I know that that was that was definitely a difficulty in 2020. Although fingers crossed, it's not quite as uh, you know the supply chains aren't quite as um, stretched as they were last year. But we definitely aren't back to um, you know pre-pandemic situation, especially when it comes to costs. Um, uh, I'm sorry, there was a second part to your question that is eluding me. Oh, just just like. Are there opportunities that like cities could have to, right. you know, partner in some way or make their own investment or something that could expand it? Yeah, but, you know, um, ARPA dollars as well. Yeah, I'll be candid. I don't think we've really considered a whole lot of um, sort of municipal partnering on on the appropriation side, but I'm I'm certainly happy to have that conversation. I don't see why. Um, it wouldn't be possible, um, especially if there's, you know, increased interest, if there's, if there's more interest with a particular um, homeownership center in terms of number of, of interested property owners than, than funds available. I don't see why a municipality couldn't commit to um, applying ARPA funds. I'll actually speak with our, um, our general counsel um, and see if, if it makes more sense for yeah, I mean, I, I, I think we could definitely share our, our grant agreements with municipalities and see if you guys wanted to do sort of a, follow a similar model and just enhance the amount that's available. Um, one, I do want to be cautious about um, reporting requirements with, with the ARPA dollars are pretty, um, are pretty stringent. Um, so I, I, I definitely want to consult and make sure that 
first of all, that, you know, everything's being kept track of so that, you know, a, a future audit, um, which is almost inevitable with these funds, um, doesn't come back with, with serious findings. And also just that um, from an administrative burden, um, if we're already doing reporting, um, you know, there's not, not really a, a good sense of why, you know, we'd, we'd have a municipality reporting on, on, on the same projects as well. So I would, I would just want to make sure that we were coordinating that, but I think it's an interesting, um, interesting thought, especially if, if you're, you're hoping to put ARPA funds towards housing development. Yeah. Um, okay. Go ahead, Lauren. Oh, no, no, I was just going to say, you know, we're, we're still like figuring out what we're going to do and lots of needs. I just, you know, housing is a top priority of our strategic plan and of our council. And, you know, as Cameron said, we're seeing, you know, obviously, as you know, well, like so many people in our community with needs. So if there was an ability to take some portion and even like sub grant it to you all to use it and then you do the reporting or something, like it would just be interesting to know if that was even an option. Um, yeah. Yeah, that I think that would probably be perhaps the most efficient. Um, if and I'll like I said, I'll I'll speak with our our general counsel and kind of pose the question and let him mull it over. Um, yeah. Thanks. Another, ask, oh, if, sorry, Michael. I, sorry, sorry, sorry. Right. I was going to ask: Is there a role here for something of uh, an organization like Habitat for Humanity to to be involved in some of these these projects? I mean, I I know that they usually. The normal way of operating is that the the potential owner has to put up some capital and some some sweat equity, but um, th it would be one way to lower the building costs if you have a volunteer core. But I don't know if that's you know would would that fit within the federal and your guidelines for for how this gets done, or do you have any restrictions on who's the car who is the contractor or or that things like that. Yeah, so we don't we don't have restrictions on who the contractor is. Fortunately, um, because uh, one benefit of of ARPA is that a lot of the uh, a lot of the um, other requirements, including environmental review and things like that, uh, are actually waived um, because it's considered a, a you know a disaster relief um, program essentially, um, which is is generally helpful just for expediency. Um, although we're still you know doing sort of cursory reviews just to make sure, you know, funds are being spent appropriately and not putting people at risk. Um, that said, uh, I don't know that there, I, I don't believe there's been any conversation with Habitat. I, uh, my, my initial reaction is, is again, because this is ARPA, um, the, the focus on on households exiting homelessness is is in large part due to um, not only the need but the fact that uh, they're considered um, that population is, is considered categorically eligible. So basically, if somebody is the um, you know the U.S. Treasury has, has essentially put in their guidance that if somebody is experiencing homelessness, then they're automatically eligible for um, COVID relief funding, um, largely to keep. Uh, keep people out of congregate shelters where obviously the virus can can spread more easily. Um, so I know that Habitat is typically, at least my understanding is they've typically focused on on home ownership um, for, uh, and, and so I, I don't know if the, if sort of the ends, um, the end user, the end resident um, would necessarily align with, with this round, but I'd definitely be interested in, um, you know, if we as, a, as I think I mentioned before, we're really hoping to turn VHIP into a, a permanent ongoing program. Um, and I think the program parameters will, will um, change and, and uh, you know, just generally evolve as, as we change funding sources and sort of see the, the longer term effects. So I definitely think there might be a, uh, an opportunity to have a conversation with, with Habitat. Uh, to be completely honest right now, um, it's a lot of coordination, even just with between our shop and the five home ownership centers and the coordinated entry lead organization. So I'd like to get the program sort of up and running and moving before we start um, bringing in more, um, more organizational stakeholders, um, just for the, <laughs> the expediency of getting, getting money out um, into the streets. So I had a clarifying question, you know, yeah. I've been talking a lot with some of the folks who experience homelessness here and 
a lot of them are very frustrated and have given up on the coordinated entry continuum of care process. So would those folks be able to work directly with Downstreet or do they need to be in the queue through the continuum of care? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a good question. I think um, right now the way, the way we are structuring it is requiring a pass through with, with coordinated entry. Um, I think we can probably, if that, if that turns into or, or becomes, you know, a, a, a bottleneck or a reason why folks aren't getting, um, getting into housing, their housing needs, um, I think, I think we'll definitely consider opening it back up to, to the larger continue of care. The one struggle as well um, for, you know, folks who, who are not, not working with coordinated entry is, is um, whether or not they have the subsidies that would be, you know, likely necessary to get them back into kind of a permanent housing situation. So we definitely want to make sure that we're not um, setting folks up for, you know, for a failed tenancy um, that could, you know, further make it difficult for them to um, to find rental, you know, other rental housing in the future because of checkered history. So it's, I, the question's well taken and, and I think um, I'll, I'll be sort of diplomatic and say that it's a, it's a, it's a difficult balancing act um, to try to make sure that we're, we're setting people up for success. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Does anyone have any other questions or? Great. Well, again, thanks. Thanks so much for, for giving me all this time to chat about this, this program and for your interest in it. Um, I'll definitely stay in touch as things, as things evolve. So you're aware of sort of where we're at. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll be updating our website and working with the, the, all the HOCs to kind of uh, make sure that there's opportunities for folks to learn more about the program. And yeah, if, um, if there's any follow-up questions um, or you know, things you think of later, certainly don't hesitate to reach out and, and I'll do my best to, to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Appreciate it. Great. Well, take care, have a great rest of your day. Thank you, you too. So yeah, I guess, do we have any like follow-up from that or like other, yeah, next steps? Well, I actually had a quick follow-up question for you, Cameron. Curious about what you've been hearing from homeless individuals about frustrations you working with, you know, the can coordinate entry organization. Well, I think a lot of the frustration that I've been hearing is, is that people can't get, there's no, there's no places to go. And so why would they wait through all of this paperwork and being checked in on? And like, why would they go through all this process just to be told at the end, there's nowhere for you to go, you're on a list, right? So uh, it's also very hard for people to get connected um, cause most of people are told to connect to these things through two, one, one, right. And so they're either being put on really long holds or they can't get a call back because they don't have phones. And so it's just, it's a very complex system to connect with and it's not easy. And so you kind of have to know what you're supposed to be doing. Right. So I'm interested to see how this I'd like to talk to Downstreet more about how they and um, you know the state intend to get the word out that this these apartments are becoming available because if they are need, if you need to be on the list now to be considered, then how are we getting people on that list? How are we making it easier for them to connect? Um, you know, uh, there's a whole host of things um, that we're trying to get good Sam in another way into the transit center now to have more phones and connect people to the continuum of care that way. It's just, it's a hard, it's, it's just, it's a bureaucracy. It's a very intense state bureaucracy system that people have a really hard time managing 
when they have no one to support them to walk through that, right? So I would say that this is just another layer of difficulty, honestly, to, to getting into the housing. But I mean, if, if it becomes available, maybe by that time, they'll have a better sense of how many people would be eligible and how many uh, apartments are available after that, right? Which would be great to know. Yeah, cool, thanks, I appreciate that. Yeah, and then I, I just wanna recognize too that I think three um, unhoused folks in Montpelier have passed away in the past month and so past couple of weeks, right? No? I don't, That's, there was a really weird email chain that came out in the last week discussing folks who had passed away and put a number between three and six. We don't, like I asked my police to, to look at any deaths that happened and they didn't find any in our, in, in Montpelier. So okay. those are very unsubstantiated. I don't really like okay. it when people do those things over emails, but I have, I don't know what people are talking about. So um, yeah. maybe, maybe we just don't know about them, but I, I, I'm going to go ahead and say probably not. Okay. Um, and then I don't, I've, I'm actually, I'm going to pause there because I was like, there's a whole other thing to open up, but, um, um, maybe can we just circle back real quick to the budget ask? So I know those were due yesterday, I believe. Um, so the budget ask for stipends for city committees, and then just if there's any update on, um, creative discourse. I don't know. Any update? So what are you looking for for the stipend for city committees? I mean, y'all were still sort of like looking at options and how you want to package that. Uh -huh. You know, our next council meeting is the 8th. Um, and then I don't know what the next one is, the 15th? Um, I think the, the, it was like, uh, to draft a, a like kind of a final proposal um with of the 42,000 but not having there be the um like not not figuring out all of the nuts and bolts of the implementation of it but putting it into the budget so that they could start in you know we could figure out the nuts and bolts of the implementation by July um but wanting to like bring that to the to the city council um as kind of the the line item proposal and so I think that all that is in the budget for 42,000, right? And so I'm just, yeah, what's, what, um, what are other, do we have any other next steps there? Sorry. Not... Yeah, if you want that to be on council's agenda to um, look at, a proposal would need to be in the hands of staff, like your written, uh, here's what we'd like you to consider. Um, Friday this week okay. or the 17th. Can we hear me? Uh, oh, go ahead. So, I mean, is this going to be like often the way the budget has been presented in recent years? Is like there's like core services and then there's like things that either committees like this are asking for and like council kind of like debates which of those we could like are gonna include in the budget? Like, is this just gonna be part of a list? So essentially like this committee just sending an email, like a, a one pager around of like, this is why this is part of the ask. Like, does it have to be, it doesn't have to be like a standalone agenda item on the- No, on no, the no, it just has to go to, it just has to go to um, uh, Kelly, uh -huh. our, our finance director. It just needs to go to Kelly for inclusion. That's it. I just mentioned the council dates because uh, we're discussing the budget at council. And, and so um, Kelly needs it at least in time to include in her materials. Gotcha. So I basically be writing up the proposal into like a one page memo, uh, sending it on Friday and then being on the city council on next Wednesday to discuss it. Is that right? Well, it would, so it, uh, Lauren is right. We're trying to pitch all of the things sort of at once. And so we're okay. starting to talk about the budget next agenda. And then the budget conversation will basically extend through January. So 
um, just the sooner is better. Jeremy, as the resident budget guru, do you, is that something that you could do or would it be helpful to have someone else such as myself to just kind of write um, up the general proposal? Well, curious to know if there is any kind of template for this that we can, okay. So I can't do that this week for sure. Um, other than maybe responding to something um, could get into it next week if no one else wants to take the lead on that. I think that would be great. Yeah, I'm like looking at my, I just looked at my calendar and I was like, well, it's not, it's not gonna happen before Friday. So mm -hmm. um, if, if we're gonna hold off then, I think that would be great, Jeremy, if you could. Um, yeah, does that sound good for folks? On top of that. Okay, I will, I'll, I'll do my best to build some kind of a one page proposal um, and then share out for you all to comment on individually over the course of next week. Cool. Thank okay. you so much. Yep. Um, and for those comments, we can send those, we'll email those comments directly back to you, Jeremy, mm -hmm. and not to the whole. Great. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then um, for creative discourse of for signing the part phase two piece, I just didn't know if there was any update from you, Cameron. There, sorry, I was trying to loop both of those things in together. No, that would need to That's go on great. a um, council agenda, but I haven't, I I haven't touched that, so I will. I will look at that and I will have a report for you by next time on what, what steps are taking and what we need to do. Cool. Thanks so much. Um, and then the other business, I just wanted to share these two things that I had gotten with a request to share. So one was the um, Human Rights Commission, HRC, I think this was called, um, scorecard of Montpelier that um, they got two weeks ago. And I um, just thought it was interesting, it would be interesting as a committee just to like look at what they're tracking um, around non-discrimination laws, like the municipality as an employer, municipal services, law enforcement, and leadership on LGBTQ equity. Obviously, this is like coming from a very, uh, uh, a, 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 pers a perspective around, um, you know, like LGBTQ work. Um, and I think there's some, you know, this is important for, for all of the work. And so just wanted to share that. I, I thought it was interesting as well. Um, and then I got the this email from Peter Kelman with a request to share it with CJAC. Um, we don't have time to discuss it today, but the proposal of pallet shelters um, for um, folks experiencing homelessness in Montpelier, I guess I'll kind of go on record of that. I think that this is, you know, would at the kind of, be at the very minimum like a, a, a band-aid um, of kind of this like broader problem that we're talking about. And I'd like to kind of more focus our committee's efforts on like structural change. Um, and, 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 but I'm, I'm open for, you know, having more conversation if folks are interested. Um, I'll say that um, I had seen this proposal before Peter contacted me and I wrote a long okay. email response. Great. That, suggesting that there were a lot of unanswered questions here about infrastructure and permits and, uh, and, uh, and until, unless and until they could get those straightened out, I didn't think, I thought it was premature to, to come to our committee with any kind of endorsement. We could encourage them to move forward, but, um, and I, I'll, I'm happy to share the, my response to Peter with you mm -hmm. if you want to see that. Uh, I'll send it to you, can, uh, to you, Shana, and you can distribute can it. Share it out. Great. Yeah. Thanks all. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, between the next meeting, um, Jeremy's going to write up the memo to be able to share with the city council. Um, Cameron's going to check in with Creative Discourse. Um, Michael's going to share this, uh, the response, I suppose. Um, any other kind of immediate next steps? So we're still thinking uh, December 15th, yeah? Your next meeting? 
-hmm. Does that work for folks? Yeah. The 15th at 8 o'clock. And normally I suggest to folks that they take a uh, holiday breather um, end of December through the first few weeks of January, wherever y'all decide, so we can talk about that um, at your next right. meeting. So I have an agenda for next meeting of the memo for council, read the stipends, uh, creative discourse contract updates, a history update for the website, if we have one, if that's ready. And then we'll be talking about holiday scheduling. That sound right? Mm -hmm. Amazing. Should, should, should I send the history text to you, Cameron? <coughs> yes, please. Okay. Um, and it, it might